Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Oh, I think some of you are still asleep. Let's try that again. Come on, you got an extra hour of sleep this morning. Let's try that again. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 All right, if you will stand with me and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to bless our worship service this morning, that he might be here. He might speak to our hearts, speak through his word, speak through Anthony this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us. We can't thank you enough. Lord, you gave us today. We're all here. We're all able to sing. We're all able to give you our worship. We are able to fellowship one with another. Father, thank you so much for all these blessings. And Lord, we've gathered together to give you our worship. You are the only one who are worthy. And so, Father, we pray that in our singing, in our fellowship, in our hearing of your word, in the preaching of your word, that you are glorified above all things. We thank you, Father, for your word. How, Lord, that no matter what we're going through, you speak to it, and we can find comfort in it. We can find peace in it. We can find guidance in it. We can also find things that correct us, Lord, that reveal our sin to us. Lord, what a blessing to have your word. So, Father, we give you all the praise, all the thanks. I ask that your spirit would work in a mighty way in our hearts. Lord, we haven't come to gain knowledge. We've come to be transformed. And so we pray your spirit would work to that end in our hearts. All to your glory, all to your honor, we pray. Amen. And if you would remain standing for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in uh, Psalm 119. i got to grab my Bible. I left it down. Psalm 119, though. Uh, flip to verses 73 through 80. Psalm 119, 73. <clears throat> it says... Your hands made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. May those who fear you see me and be glad because I wait for your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. O oh, may your loving kindness comfort me according to your word to your servant. May your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be ashamed, for they subvert me with a lie, but I shall meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, even those who know your testimonies. May my heart, may my heart be blameless in your statutes, so that I will not be ashamed. And all of God's people said, seated. Well, we have a special speaker this Sunday. Anthony Lang is here with us and his family, and uh, he's going to be bringing the word. And as Craig said, uh, be sure to stay after. Um, he's going to give his testimony, and God has just worked a lot in his life, um, brought him from some very tough circumstances, and that's what our God does. Amen? He does that to each and every one of us. So, uh, Anthony, I'll turn it over to you. If you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47 this morning. Um, <clears throat> I just want to thank you for the warm welcome you guys have given us, and both of us, my wife and my family, feel very welcomed, and we are so thankful to be able to come here and serve you and open God's Word for you. Obviously, my wife is not opening God's Word for you, but um, she is happy to be here with me as I do that, so um, if you would turn in your Bibles to Acts 2, and we're going to be in verses 41 through 47. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so I'm starting in verse 41. It says, so those, you know what, let's start in verse 37. I think it'll be helpful. <clears throat> so 237. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let me just pray before we get into the message. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for revealing yourself to us through your Son. We thank you for your word. And God, we thank you for this wonderful portrait of the first local church. We, we thank you that you've given this to us so that we can know how we ought to live as believers right now in this point in time, that gathering today as a local church is your plan for your people. God, I pray that as we look at this, you would give us clarity and give us um, a sense of our identity with one another that we have by being united with you in Christ. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so when I was a new believer, um, I remember, you know, I kind of shared last night that I started doing evangelism before I really even knew what I was supposed to tell people. Uh, I just never felt like I could read the word without feeling like I was supposed to tell somebody about what I was reading. Um, and, and, you know, one thing that I often told people as I told them about Christ was that, you know, you get that rebuttal of, well, I'm not really the religious type, right? And, and I would say things like, um, you know, you don't have to be part of a church to be a believer, right? You, know, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go be a church folk to be a follower of Christ. And, and while that's true, in a sense, you can be a believer without being in a local church, Right? That is an unrealistic and unbiblical approach to the Christian life. It sets people up for failure. Um, and, and also, the idea that we can follow Christ apart from gathering and growing with a local church is not found in the New Testament. There are no examples of it. You know, saying that you can be a believer without belonging to a gathering of God's people is like saying you can be a husband but never being at home with your family. Or it's like saying you can be an employee but never show up to work. They're, they, they're contrary to one another. They, they don't make sense in a, in a logical sense. The local church, what we are doing here today is God's plan for God's people. That's, that's what God wants his people to do. And so, as we look at this text, the, the, the big idea, if you, will, if you will, is that believing in the gospel means that you belong with God's people. So look at, look at what happened when these people believed the gospel in verse 41. It says, those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Peter preaches the gospel to these people. He, he makes the object of the gospel very clear. It's Jesus Christ, the long-awaited Messiah who was raised from the dead. And, and he says the goal, the goal of this is repentance that leads to the forgiveness of our sins. We see that in verse 38. It says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. So the object is Christ, the goal is repentance, and the product is spirit-regenerated and empowered people. He says that they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So those who accepted the gospel, those who believed in Christ, automatically belonged with God's people. They were baptized and they were added to the Lord. And when we, when we think of this phrase, added to the Lord, that means you're added to his universal body, right? You're added to the body of Christ. And as you see this played out in the New Testament, what you find is that those who were added to the universal body of Christ 
showed that they were part of that body by identifying and gathering with a local expression of that universal body, body, i.e. a local church. So when we believe the gospel, we are forgiven of our sins, we are made alive by the Spirit, and we are united with God's people. But we often stop at this point. We often stop at the, the... the being joined to the universal church, right? We stop and we just say, okay, that's fine. I'm part of the universal body of Christ that spans the entire globe. And we shouldn't downplay this, right? This is a beautiful thing. There's already been believers today who have been gathering, right? And we're a part of them. We're a part of that spiritual family. So we don't want to downplay this because it's a beautiful and wonderful truth of the gospel But the way that the Bible talks about people who belong to that universal body is that they would belong and be committed to a local gathering of those people. Let me just kind of lay out the biblical case for this. So what I'm doing right now is I'm building the porch. I'm building the theological porch so then we can go inside to the house so we can understand how and what we should do. So the the description of the Jerusalem church in Acts chapter 6, there's this this narrative of there's a a dispute, if you will, where the Hellenists um, are getting upset over the gathering. And what we see in that picture is that they functioned as a congregation and they submitted to apostolic authority. So by the time we leave from Acts chapter 2 and get to Acts chapter 6, we see that this Jerusalem church is functioning as a congregation and they're doing it under apostolic authority. And then when you get to Acts chapter 8, verse 1, let's just turn there real quick. Let's read that. So they're functioning as a congregation. They have recognized apostolic authority over them. And then in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, we know the story of Stephen being persecuted and murdered. It says, and Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And the church... In Jerusalem. So what we see here is that those people who joined the universal body of Christ expressed that they were part of that by being a part of a local gathering, a local gathering of God's people. So all of this is to say that when people believed the gospel, they were added to a real local gathering group of believers. And it's assumed in the passage we're looking at here that believing the gospel automatically leads to belonging with God's people. You know, when, when, when you think about how the church started, Jesus chose his disciples in Luke 6. He chose the apostles who he was going to send out and take his message, right? And then he promised in Matthew 16 that he was going to build his church. And then in John chapter 17, he prays for those who are going to believe the message that he gave to the apostles. And then in Matthew 28, he gives the great commission. And what does the, what does the book of Acts detail for us? It details how they carried out the Great Commission. How did they carry out the Great Commission? Acts 1.8 says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And if you want to understand the book of Acts, that's your key that unlocks the narrative of the book of Acts. Because that's what the book of Acts is. It's the detailing of the spread of, of the gospel from Jerusalem to throughout the entire world. But what happened when that gospel spread? You know, we oftentimes think, we, we kind of like romanticize the, the apostles' ministry, and we think that there were like these rogue evangelists who just kind of went around and like spread the gospel, and there was no organization. They kind of like wandered through the wilderness and went through cities and told people about Jesus and just kind of left everybody to their own devices. But that's actually not what you see. What you actually see is that the the fulfillment of the Great Commission is not just evangelism. It's the planting of local churches. That's God's plan for us. That's what the church is to do. When, When Jesus chose his apostles, he gave them apostolic doctrine. And what the New Testament teaches us is that in Ephesians 2.20, that the church, the household of God, is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. 
We also see in 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 15 that the household of God is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The foundation of the apostles is the apostolic doctrine that was given to them directly from Christ, proclaimed by them, and as it was proclaimed, it was laid as the foundation of the local churches that were going to be planted, and those local churches are the expression of the universal church. You know, the fact that verse 42 in the passage we're looking at this morning says that the believers in Jerusalem devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching demonstrates that their mission was not just evangelism, because if it was just evangelism, there wouldn't be any ongoing ministry that needed to be there. The apostles wouldn't need to be teaching in that context if all they were to do was evangelize. So when we think about the local church, the local church is the preserver, protector, and propagator of apostolic doctrine. And it's by our commitment to a local church that we engage and participate in the mission and message of the apostles that has been given to the church. So let's let me just summarize what I've what I've kind of said so far. That the first example of the post-resurrection conversion of believers led to them joining the Jerusalem church. The apostles' message and mission was the establishment of local churches. And the New Testament gives us no designation for a believer who does not belong to a local church. Why do we try to create a category for people who will not commit to God's people in a local church? Why do we try to create a category for Christians who will not associate themselves with other Christians? And and I I have some theories on this, and and I think one of them is is really clear, actually. We want to offer the perfect Christ without offering his imperfect people, right? Right? And, and you know what we do when we do that? If I meet somebody and I lead them to the Lord or God leads them to the Lord through me sharing the gospel with them and I tell them, you can just go be a believer. You don't actually need to belong to a local church. Do you know what we actually do to somebody when we do that? If we say, you can follow the perfect Christ and you don't actually have to have anything to do with his imperfect people. We actually cut off the greatest means of grace that God has for believers. And you know why that is? Because when you commit to a local gathering of God's people and you say, these are my people who I'm going to serve and commit my life to, you make a commitment that means that you have to stay committed through thick and thin. You know that the sins of the people in this congregation against you is the best way for you to understand the gospel after you've believed it because we have to apply that to one another? When, when we join with God's imperfect people, we have to apply the gospel to people other than ourselves. And that's the beauty of the local church. When a grievance occurs in the local church, we're required to seek forgiveness and reconciliation. The reality is that there's probably people in this church right now that you don't like. And that's okay. <laughs> That's, that's actually what the church is supposed to do because every week you come here, you have to remember that Jesus Christ has forgiven you of your sins and therefore you're going to apply that same forgiveness to them. It forces you to apply the gospel. God uses sinful people to afford us the opportunity to see the gospel lived out by seeking and offering the forgiveness that Christ has given to us. So Christ intends his imperfect people to make us more like himself. And that's why believing the gospel means that we belong with God's people. So when we commit ourselves to a real local group of gathering believers, we are committing to demonstrate the gospel we believed to the lives of other imperfect people. People who are just as imperfect as us. And so while, while we may be able to be a genuine believer and not belong to a local church, a local gathering of God's people, the best thing that can happen for a person who does that is that they will become a spiritually unhealthy believer. Let me, let me just tell you why. First off, you can't actually perform your spiritual gifts in the way that God has called you to do that. We were given the gifts for the common good, Right? And, and, and that's for, in the context of a local church, it's, it's easy to stay home or what I mean is not commit 
and then kind of just do spiritual deeds without the messiness of having to deal with people who are messy people. But, but even, even not just that, I mean, there's actually commands in Scripture that we actually just can't, we can't actually obey if we're not a part of a local church. Let, let me just kind of lay it out for you. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then Hebrews 13, 17 says that we're supposed to obey and submit our leaders in the Lord. How can we obey that if we don't actually have any recognized spiritual authority over us? And, and you know, the celebrity YouTube pastor is not going to come to your bedside. I'm sorry, he's not. He doesn't have time. <laughs> and it's because he's not responsible for you. He's not responsible for us. And, and if, we don't, if we don't have recognized spiritual authority over our lives, biblically speaking, that's actually not a good thing. Our culture pushes against any kind of organized um, authority, but, but biblically, the maturity of a believer is gauged by how they respond to spiritual authority, not how they can evade it. There's not a context in life where we are not under authority. And, and so we have to recognize that. And, and so what I'm saying here, coming back around to it, if we are not committed to a local church, there's actually portions of Scripture we can't do. So that, that would produce, at best, a spiritually unhealthy Christian and a very, very... Um, trying to think of the word shrunk, that's a terrible word, uh, minimized, minimized way to carry out your faith in Christ. It, it makes the circle, the sphere of your influence so small and so myopic. And so that's our theology. That's our porch, right? That's our porch. And now let's go inside the house and see what the local church looks like. So we belong to a local church, and part of that belonging, we're going to break this down into two aspects here. The first thing is that we belong in the life of the local church, and we belong in the lives of those who belong to the local church. Let's look at belonging to the life of the local church. We see this in, verses, in verse 42 here. Belonging to the life of the local church is being committed to gathering for God's means of grace in the context of the local church. It says that they were devoted to the teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. This idea of devotion means to be busily engaged in something. It carries the idea of ongoing dedication to a certain activity. And, and right here it's saying you're devoted to what the church does. The church gathers for fellowship. The church gathers to hear apostolic teaching. The church gathers to take the Lord's Supper. And the church gathers to pray. And, and I don't think we should view, you know, so many people have like romanticized this, this portrait here. And, and you have these people who say, you know, we're going to put off any organized type of church context and we're just going to create our little like house movement thing right and they romanticize this picture of like we're going to go back to acts chapter two the same thing every church has been doing for thousands of years right and and the whole thing is is that acts chapter two is a seed that all the epistles <laughs> had to water and root weeds out of the garden so um unless paul was unable to do <laughs> the work of actually plant keeping a church this pure we shouldn't expect that we can do this outside of the gathering of God's people. This is not something we're going to romanticize and take and, and make it our own little private thing with no organization because the church has organization. It has things it has to be committed to. And that's what these are, the means of grace. And so what, what he's explaining here is what happens to people's lives on account of them believing in Christ. These people believed in Christ, and therefore they belonged in the life of the local church. And the first thing we see is that they were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. So the, the church is founded on God's word, and it functions by God's word. So the founding, I think we already talked about that, that, that the apostles were the ones who laid the apostolic foundation for the church. So a church is only a church insofar as it is fulfilling what the Bible tells it to fulfill. 
The church is not some institution or some club where we gather around because we all have similar interests. The church is something, an organism, that is built upon the foundation of biblical truth. But it also functions by God's word, right? So whenever we think about why we do what we do, we should be able to see that our rationale is a biblical one. We have a biblical reason for what we do. So when you're gathering here this morning from the pulpit, as God's word is preached faithfully, the spirit works in the hearts of God's people to transform them, making them more into the image of Christ. And then as you go out from this, we do from person to person ministry. We speak the truth in love to one another. So our, our, our relationships in the church have to, be, have to revolve around God's word being applied to one another's lives. I mentioned that joining with the imperfect people of God to worship the perfect risen Savior requires us to apply the gospel to one another's lives. And, and that's how the church functions. We are constantly applying the gospel to one another's lives. And when we immerse ourselves into the life of the local church, we are committing ourselves, committing ourselves to our brothers and sisters in Christ that we are going to strive to see you become more like Jesus Christ. Paul says that he was in anguish until the people were formed into the image of Christ. And that's how we should view our brothers and sisters in Christ. Man, when, our, when we see somebody struggling with sin, we shouldn't be looking for a way to not have to deal with their problems we should be in anguish saying, brother, sister, I want to see you grow more like Jesus Christ. How can I help you? Let's look at the word together. And, and that's how the church functions by God's word. And, and really, I think something that's really important to think about here is that all of us come to church or all of us gather as a church with a personal bias, right? Let me flesh this out. Um, I am more prone toward the evangelistic type of ministry, right? So what's my solution for every problem in the church? We need to do more evangelism. We need to plant more churches. But then you have another person who's more, more geared toward the mercy aspect, right? And, and I could be over here, evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. Who cares? Who cares? You know, and the mercy person's like, hey, dude, like, you need to chill out because you actually don't sound very kind, you actually sound like you just want to evangelize. You don't actually care about people. And then what happens is that these two come together and they collide. And you know what happens? The body functions how it's supposed to function. So as we seek to obey God's word as he's gifted us and actually carry out our spiritual gifts in the context of the church, we need people who are different than us. We need people who are gifted differently so that as our gifts work together, we can function as the body that Christ has called us to be. We belong in the life of the local church because the people who are different than us are going to challenge us and make us more well-rounded as we seek to obey God's word. You know, hearing sermons preached <clears throat> as a church, the, one of the things about not gathering with God's people, when, when you could, when you could, hear me out, um, one of the things that's a problem about that is that you actually, you actually miss out on the opportunity for other people to apply the same message that you heard, right? So if you're, and, and also you, you miss out on the accountability that takes place through that. So there is something special happening here. This gathering here is not like the people who are going to a Lions football game today, right? Or a football game or any kind of sporting event. This is a unique Spirit-empowered gathering of God's people. And so here's what happens when we don't come to hear God's word preached. We miss out on the accountability that takes place in that. And let me explain to you what I mean by this. When I hear God's word preached, and I actually have real relationships in a community of people who are struggling with sin, I can actually hear God's word preached and think to myself, I wonder how my brother or sister in Christ is hearing this right now because I know they've been struggling with this. I'm going to follow up with them. And we miss out on that process when we're not here. We, we miss out on that because we're not immersed in the life of the local church. We, we have to be here with each other, gathering with other sinful people, applying the word that we hear to one another, whether from the pulpit or whether it's read from Scripture or whether we're reading it as well. 
But the life of the local church also revolves around fellowship. You see, it says here that they were devoted to the fellowship, and we see that this is carried out even more in verses 46 and 47. It says that they were breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. Um, so, so the local church is also committed to fellowship. Fellowship describes participating in Christ-centered and Christ-honoring relationships united by the Spirit. Um, and, and I think that the, the rebuttal, right, is couldn't I just do this with any believer anywhere? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. But have you considered, have we considered, that our natural human nature makes us want to surround ourselves with people who are identical to ourselves, right? We, that's how we are. We want to be around people who are the exact same kind of person as me. And, and when we do that, we, we cut ourselves off from the challenges and the sanctification that comes from being with people who have different interests, different goals, come from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, and even different employment. And so when we are committed to fellowship in the local church, it forces us to welcome others as Jesus Christ has welcomed us. People who we have nothing in common with other than the fact that we both love Jesus Christ. But the local church also revolves around gathering for the Lord's Supper. Um, this, this phrase, breaking of bread, is a, is a reference to the Lord's Supper. And, and I think the early church probably observed it more than us, but Scripture never actually gives us anything about how often we're supposed to take it. Um, and it says that they were, they were doing it day by day. They did it in their homes. This is a unique time in the life of the church. But... I think that the fact that it says breaking bread in their homes and taking the Lord's Supper like that, we, we might think to ourselves that, well, then we don't need to gather as a local church to do it. We can just do it any time. But let me just kind of lay something out for you that um, these people submitted themselves to the same apostolic authority, right? Uh, we, we looked at that in Acts chapter 6. Um, Paul gives a description saying that when they took the Lord's Supper, they did it as they came together as a church. And Paul warns people of taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. I mean, one of the things that we just talked about was how if you're not committed to a local church, there's certain commands that you can't obey. And so, if you're taking the Lord's Supper and there's actually areas in our lives that we can't obey, that's a problem, right? So it's something we need to be thinking about. And as we gather to take the Lord's Supper, God uses this in our lives to remind us, to remind us of what Jesus Christ has done for us in his death for us. And when we gather to participate in the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of what our Lord does for us and we are forced to reckon with our sin again. And the last part of the life of the local church is that they gathered for prayers. Uh, you know, the the point here is that it's, it's plural, prayers. Um, I think that some people suggest that this might be an allusion to some kind of a Jewish prayer schedule, but I don't really think that's the case, and I don't really think it makes a difference, to be honest with you. Um, I, I actually have a summary of all the times that prayer is mentioned in the book of Acts. If you want to do something interesting, you can look at certain things in this book. And if you were to look at my Bible, you would see I have different colored highlighting. And one of them is for proclaiming the gospel, one is for persecution, one is for praying, and one is for the works of the Spirit. And that is really the DNA of the church. And if you go through the book of Acts and you make sure you highlight that, you'll see that there's some really cool things that happens in the local church. But let me just tell you, what the prayers look like for the church. I'm just going to name them off. If you want the list, come talk to me afterward. I'll give it to you. They prayed when making a decision. They prayed for God's protection and for him to empower their mission. They prayed for God's blessing and enablement on those who serve him. They prayed for the Holy Spirit to come upon people who had not received him. They prayed that certain people would be spared from God's judgment. They prayed for God to intervene in dire situations. They prayed prayers of praise. They prayed when they said farewells. They thanked God for his provision in prayer. And they prayed for healing. The life of the local church devotes itself to prayer 
And this should probably be a blend of scheduled times of prayer and spontaneous times of prayer where we just get together and seek the Lord together in prayer. So that's the life of the local church. But we don't only belong in the life of the local church. We belong in the lives of those who who belong to the local church. As those who have believed the gospel, we belong in relationships that honor Christ. And the local church is the place where we find those relationships. Church is not an activity that we do. Church is an identity of who we are. Our Western culture makes everything about an activity that needs to get done. But the church is not an activity that we get done. The church is an identity that we gain in Christ. And we carry out this identity through our relationships with one another. And there's specific ways that God has told us to carry out these relationships. Look at in this verse where it says that they were together, right? It says that um, day by day. Which verse is it? And all came upon them all. They were selling their possessions and belongings. Attending, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. So, the first thing is that they were together, right? Verse 44 says that. Um, It says that they were together and had all things in common. You know, the word together here does not mean together as in everybody in one place at one time. Let me me tell you why we know that. Because it says they were breaking bread from house to house. So, they weren't actually together together right? At one time. This, and other translations actually have this saying they were with one accord, with one mind. What this, what this word is describing is unity and purpose. They were unified in the things that Christ had given the church to do. And as a follower of Christ, we belong in relationships that are unified around Christ's ministry and mission for the church. And if we're not intentional about cultivating these relationships with one another, we will likely have a life filled with relationships that pull us from these relationships. If, if we are not intentional about having relationships that revolve around unity in the local church of doing what Christ has commanded us to do, our culture, our life will fill us with things and people and activities that will always be pulling us from this unity, pulling us from these relationships. And our relationship should be unified around seeing people come to Christ and seeing people cultivate Christ's likeness and seeing people experience the grace of Christ as we care for them. Because that's what they did. They distributed to people as they had need. And we belong in these kinds of relationships. We belong in relationships that have reciprocal generosity, where we are caring for one another, where we love one another, and people are able to experience the grace of Christ through our generosity to them. Now, what they were doing here, when it says that they, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, uh, there's really only one of two things this can be. Either this is the budding form of communism, or it can mean they kept their possessions but were willing to sell them. Let me give you the biblical rationale for this, that it wasn't communism, right? If you turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 32, Acts 4, 32 says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And then, when you just look over a little bit, we we come to the rascals, Ananias and Sapphira, right? And this is an interesting thing. They are struck dead for giving in a way where they wanted to steal God's glory for themselves. But look at what Peter says to him. Peter says to him, look, the stuff belonged to you. you. You didn't have to give it to us. You didn't have to lie about it. It was yours when you sold it. So the idea that everyone sold everything, gave it to the apostles, they distributed it as some form of communism is not what Scripture is telling us here. It's that people were willing to give as people had need. They were willing to sacrifice their things so that other people could experience the grace of Christ through their generosity. And I think that we struggle with this 
Uh, well, in two ways. The first, I think the way that we probably struggle with it in our more Western culture more is admitting that we need help. Because if I admit that I need help, that means I have to humble myself and tell people that I'm in need. But I think we also struggle with this by not giving to people, just not being generous, not planning to be generous. You know, and someone could make the argument that these relationships can exist outside the context of a local church. And I just want to circle back around to the same thing I've been kind of driving home here. Yes, these relationships can exist outside of the local church. Yes, they can. You actually have a biblical commandment to take care of your family. But isn't there something about having to give to people who you don't have anything in common with that reminds you of what Christ has done for you? And let me just, you might be compelled by the Spirit of God to give to a person that you don't like. That's Christ-likeness. We are Christ-like to the extent that we cover over the faults of others so that we can be gracious to them. And giving in the context of a local church is the place where God brings that all together. There are people in the church who you might have no other motivation whatsoever to help them other than the fact that they are your fellow brother or sister in Christ and they are in need. It is, it is a means for us to make another person praise God for what he has given us. I cannot tell you guys how many times as a young seminarian with lots of kids coming along uh, in a very short period of time how our church ministered to us. Random checks. Anonymous envelopes that we didn't tell anybody we needed. But God did. And that's what God does in our hearts when we're in the church. He makes needs known to us. That's what he does when we're together. So we, we as we are generous, the local church amplifies that because it, it, it fades away any other kind of association with the people that you're in relationships with. And, and you come to them and you give to them because they are a follower of Christ and they are in need. And you want them to praise God for your generosity to them. And finally, you belong in relationships that make Christ attractive to the outside world. Look at what it says here. It says that they had favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We recognize that this favor wasn't going to last for long. They were getting ready to be persecuted here in a short time. But the kind of life these people were living was attractive to the outside world. It caused them to have favor with people so that those people wanted to hear the message that they had to say. And the effect of this is that they grew as a church. What this church did in their relationships with one another made Jesus Christ attractive and allowed them to preach the word to open ears. Did you know that the way that you treat your brother and sister in Christ is an evangelistic tool in the hands of your Lord? You know, so many people talk about being a radical Christian, right? And that, that's, that's great. Be radical. But do you want to know what, what real radicalness, I know it's not a word, but do you want to know what that really looks like? It looks like forgiving people who have sinned against you. It, it looks like praising God together with people that you had to forgive Sunday morning. <laughs> it looks like showing up again and again to be kind and gracious to people who may have offended you years ago. It's doing what this church did. They gathered together and their relationships were characterized by enjoying the good gifts that God gave and offering him the praise he was due and applying the gospel to one another's lives. You know, when COVID started, I remember looking on social media and I remember telling Kaylee, man, people got, I don't know if it's because they had too much time on their hands, but people got really mean really quick. Believers, believers were saying things that I couldn't even imagine. And I told Kaylee, I said, when this stuff is all over, you know what? There are going to be a lot of believers 
who are very surprised at all of the lost people that they have killed their opportunity to lead to the Lord. They've destroyed it because they've made, they've made themselves just like the world they're living in. There's nothing attractive about them because there's nothing different about them. Being radical is being gracious in a culture that is built on oppression. It's being forgiving in a culture that does not forgive. It's reflecting Christ in difficult relationships. And the most wonderful thing about all this, the most wonderful thing about the picture of this local church is that God has provided us with everything that we need to be this church. It doesn't mean it's going to be a church without difficulties, but God has given us his word. He's given us his spirit. He's given us resources to use for his glory. And so this is achievable. It's, it's not some abstract thing that we're never going to enjoy as a church. God has given us commands. He's given us clear directions. And we can be this kind of people. And it just starts with being the kind of people who want to reflect Christ in their relationships and reflect that to the outside world. It's taking down our signs of the things that we hate and putting our welcome mats up to welcome lost people into our home that don't agree with us on anything and sharing the truth of the gospel with them. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for establishing this church and this community for a very long time. And Lord, I just want to pray for this community, pray for this church. I pray that there would be many, many people added to you in this community through this church. God, and I just pray that you would help us to be people who are faithful to you as we seek to live as the church in this age. God, help us to be people who are quick to forgive and who are slow to anger. Lord, I pray that you would use the sins of the people who, who, who are even here today that we might remember. Use them as a means of grace in our life to remember your forgiveness for us and then apply that to them. God, help us to see that our only hope, our only hope for seeing real change anywhere is if you regenerate the hearts of people. God, help us. Help us to be faithful with the gospel. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>